Hello everyone. This lesson is going to cover parts of chapter 15 on the special senses. Um, earlier this semester we talked a lot about um, sensing um, in terms of neurons, the dendrites in particular of neurons, um, having receptors or having some kind of specialized ends that detect some sort of stimulus. Right, the stimulus would then depolarize a cell and action potentials are generated, sending the message of this um, experience, right, this factor in the environment, um, internal or external, um, sending this message to the central nervous system and therefore be processed within the brain. Um, so that in general is just general sensing. Um, a lot of that information comes back at this point. Uh, so remembering that depolarization is raising the charge um, inside a cell, um, therefore bringing it closer to threshold. Once threshold is reached, then a lightning fast electrical signal is generated. So an action potential shoots down the length of the axon. And at the very end of the axon, uh, this electrical signal is going to stimulate the release of neurotransmitters to relay this message to another neuron. All right, so all of that comes back. Um, and again, for the most part, that is general senses, right? That's all we've talked about so far. Um, so really what does make a sense special as opposed to general? Um, well, in elementary school, you probably learned about the five senses or the five special senses. Um, for the most part, uh, that holds true. Um, so the special senses um, convey very specific stimuli. In particular, they, um, they detect uh, scents, right? So the sense of smell is called olfaction, the sense of taste, uh, station, uh, vision, hearing. Um, and you guys probably learned that the fifth sense was touch, but in fact, the fifth special sense is not touch. In fact, um, the sense of touch is a general sense, right? so not touch. Uh, but we do indeed have five special senses. Um, the fifth one happens to be what is called vestibular sensation. sensation. Um, and this is essentially detecting where your head is, um, maintaining balance or equilibrium. And right? so again, the five special senses um, are listed here, smell, taste, vision, hearing, and equilibrium. Um, and all of these um, stimuli are detected within very specialized organs within the head. So a little bit more about what is so special about these special senses. Um, first of all, the stimuli that are detected um, are super specific, right? So we have to have very highly modified cells to be able to detect photons of light. Right. Not only detect that there is light versus darkness, but how intense is that light, what wavelength, and therefore what color is that light, um, and so on and so forth. Right. So we have to convert these um, fairly abstract, a lot of times, uh, conditions into an electrical signal. Um, sound waves, right? so this movement um, through the air is, again, converted by very specialized cells into an electrical stimulus. And we're going to talk about that um, in this PowerPoint. Right, on the other hand, general sensations um, are exactly that. They're just very general, right? You feel um, touch, uh, you feel a general temperature. Um, these can be detected by regular old uh, neurons. They don't have to have very highly adapted cells to be able to detect these stimuli. Um, and so what is different about these receptors? Um, first of all, um, general senses contain neurons that just have you know, modified um, receptive ends, so the dendrites um, containing particular types of um, receptors. Um, in the special senses neurons, um, these cells are not neurons. Um, they can be depolarized, um, just like a neuron would. They can release things like neurotransmitters, but um, these cells for the most part um, have very unique molecules, very unique structures within them. Um, so they can really only detect um, sound or light or whatever. Okay. Um, next, the location. The special senses are entirely confined to the head um, and they send the messages, right? So whatever you taste, whatever you smell, um, they send this information um, along axons in the cranial nerves, right? So there's 12 pairs of cranial nerves, all of which communicating either directly with the brain in the case of the first pair um, or um, within the brainstem. Um, 
General senses, on the other hand, um, they can also utilize the spinal nerves, right? So they can utilize um, this uh, nervous tissue that is surrounded or that is distributed throughout the body. Okay. Uh, one other thing that we've actually talked about before, uh, so long ago at this point, um, we talked about different types of neurons. And I told you that there are unipolar, multipolar, and bipolar neurons. And generally, you find these types of neurons um, different places with different functions. So what I want to point out at this point is that the general senses, so what we've been talking about all semester, are unipolar, right? So they have one single extension off of the neuron cell body, right? So the receptive ends are just these little specialized dendrites right here. Um, the type of um, receptor is going to determine um, what stimulus they're able to detect. Um, on the other hand, the bipolar neurons I told you were super rare and that they were only found in the special senses. And so now we're going to actually see the bipolar neurons. Okay, so um, as I said, most of the special senses utilize these very specialized receptor cells, right? They're not actually neurons, but they do detect something in the environment and they do depolarize and release neurotransmitters. Um, and so these specialized receptor cells are what are relaying the message to the bipolar neuron, and then the bipolar neuron is going to relay this um, somewhere else in the central nervous system. And the one exception to this is the sense of smell, um, and as we'll um, see in the notes here shortly, the sense of smell is by far the most primitive of all of the senses. Um, that is, it most likely evolved first, and it's really simple in comparison to the other senses. Um, and so, um, the sense of smell only contains bipolar neurons that are directly detecting the chemicals that enter into your nasal cavity. Okay, um, so those are just some general differences between general senses and the special senses. Again, this PowerPoint is going to walk you through um, the special senses only. And the way that um, this lesson is going to walk you through these senses is for the most part, um, a professor named Dr. Chris Sullivan uh, from Mesa Community College is going to walk you through and um, make some nice drawings and tell you about some clinical implications of the special senses. Um, he has broken his lesson down into four learning objectives, and so I also include these learning objectives. Now, as you follow along in his lesson, I will interject once in a while and elaborate on some things. I will throw a couple extra clips in here, animating a couple um, concepts that I find to be particularly important or you know, really nice to be able to see in animation of these things working. Um, but for the most part, you are going to be listening to him um, and following along in my notes. Now, my notes do not follow what he's saying exactly. Um, pretty much, um, I give you images and a little bit of text to kind of support what he is walking through, um, but your job will be to listen to what he's saying and of course take notes with that, um, refer to my diagrams and most definitely refer to the things that I've typed because all of these things are going to be relevant for future exams uh, or the quiz and then ultimately the lecture exam. Um, terms that are particularly important, uh, just like we can see here, are going to be uh, purple and underlined, right? So if you're the type of person to make flashcards um, or um, at least need a little bit more guidance about you know, what topics are most important for you to spend time with, um, these words will guide you. Right? So look for the purple underlined words. Um, certainly that is not all you will be tested on, but um, it's definitely a good start. Okay, so, um, enjoy uh, Dr. Sullivan's presentation. And again, I will uh, jump in once in a while um, to elaborate on some concepts. Welcome, this video is on special senses. This is lecture 13. The learning objectives that we'll cover include the chemical senses of smell and taste. We'll also uh, cover hearing and balance. And then we'll finish with the sense of vision and how you're able to see using the eye. The first learning objective we'll cover is compare and contrast the chemical senses of smell and taste. Smell and taste are both uh, triggered by chemicals that can uh, cause action potentials in special neurons that are routed back towards the brain. So with the, the sense of smell, 
chemicals are actually liberated or released from uh, things like cookies and gasoline and those chemicals actually float up through the air travel to your nasal uh, cavity and then they actually are going to bind to special olfactory neurons in your nasal cavity so it's kind of gross to think about sometimes but if you're smelling something you're basically touching parts and chemicals liberated or released from those uh, substances. So remember you have epithelium lining your nasal cavity. Embedded in that nasal epithelium is going to be olfactory neurons. Now these olfactory neurons are just cells but they're special because they actually make olfactory receptor proteins that can bind to specific uh, chemicals uh, again which we're just calling odorants. When these chemicals bind to these cells they trigger action potentials and those action potentials then are routed back towards your brain and your brain interprets those as smelling cookies uh, or gasoline or poo. All right, so remember our sense of smell is basically a chemical sense. These chemicals bind to specific proteins that are expressed on our olfactory neurons of our nasal cavity, generating action potential bursts, which are then routed back to the brain, and the brain is left to interpret those uh, as specific smells and as good or bad. These olfactory neurons are pretty much a standard sensory neuron. Uh, they're a little unique in how they're shaped, uh, but they basically send axons through the ethmoid bone, and then these dendrites are actually embedded in the uh, nasal epithelium within the mucus uh, in our airways, in their nasal cavity. So these olfactory receptor proteins are expressed on the dendrites, the little nerve endings. And these olfactory neurons then can detect chemicals uh, that make it up into your nasal cavity. It's basically think of it like a shape. A certain chemical will be able to bind to only one of those receptor proteins. That will cause the entry of sodium or calcium into the cell, triggering action potentials. The action potentials are routed uh, back through these olfactory bulbs uh, and finally to the cerebral cortex. You might remember that this is cranial nerve number one getting the signals uh, from your nasal cavity to the olfactory bulbs. Okay, so remember, olfactory neurons detect chemicals in our nasal cavity using these tiny little receptor proteins. If we could zoom in and imagine that we only had six uh, olfactory neurons, you'd probably have thousands, uh, maybe millions. But in the six here we're showing, we're showing the dendrites of these little olfactory neurons expressing only one specific olfactory receptor protein. So wine chemicals, chemicals from wine, will only be able to trigger and bind to specific receptor proteins, which will cause then uh, some subset of your olfactory neurons to generate action potentials. Similarly, vegetables or any chemicals that you're smelling are going to trigger uh, only a certain subset of olfactory neurons because they only will bind to specific olfactory receptor proteins. So an interesting thing about your olfactory neurons is these olfactory receptor proteins are typically only expressed uh, in one single neuron, meaning so one neuron will only make one of these 300 or so different proteins. So each neuron then can only detect one specific type of smell. Since you have 300 genes and make about 300 different proteins, you can imagine that you can smell a lot of different chemicals. You can also imagine, since our DNA is variable between individuals, that there's certainly a lot of uh, genetic variation between these proteins, and so your sense of smell will be very specific to you. I wanted to remind you that the olfactory bulbs then route this, uh, these action potentials from the olfactory neurons and send the different information to your cerebral cortex and brain regions. Your brain then has to interpret what you're smelling, uh, whether it's good or bad or uh, how much it's smelling and things like that. So where is the smell signals, where are the smell signals sent? In the brain, um, for your awareness, they're sent to the temporal lobe, kind of the temporal frontal lobe but they're also sent to places like the hippocampus, amygdala, and hypothalamus, and also even your midbrain, which might mean why chemicals make you feel alert. Uh, but also chemicals can affect your limbic system and your emotional state. Also, very powerful memories can be triggered by smell.
So a lot of a lot more is known about uh, how smell is 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 sort of interpreted by the brain. We do know that each neuron probably only responds to a specific uh, chemical or set of chemicals, and then the brain has to interpret patterns uh, to figure out what you're actually smelling. Not too long ago, I saw this news article that said people who can't smell only have a few years left to live. And I thought that was kind of strange. So I actually uh, looked up the actual journal article and it said olfactory dysfunction predicts five year mortality in older adults. And this might make sense to you since your sense of smell is based on neurons and the brain functioning well. Uh, it might make sense to you that when your sense of smell goes, it probably is an indicator that other parts of your nervous system and brain aren't working well. All right, what about taste? Uh, it's also a chemical sense. So if you think about it, chemicals in your food are going to be uh, released into your saliva and diffuse around on top of your tongue. You have these things on your tongue, uh, these little lumps, and some of those lumps contain taste buds. Taste buds are simply clusters of taste cells uh, and helper cells. And these taste cells are much like your taste neurons. They're able to detect chemicals in your saliva. Now these taste cells aren't technically neurons, but they're going to function in a similar way. So in a way you can think of taste kind of like smelling with your tongue. So in terms of taste, we've got these little taste cells stuck around our taste buds on our tongue. These little taste cells will have receptor, uh, neuro, uh, excuse me, receptor proteins that can detect chemicals. These little taste cells will lead, uh, need relay neurons in order to get those action potentials back towards your brain. So again, our sense of uh, smell is, is dependent on olfactory neurons. Our sense of taste is going to depend on these little taste cells stuck in these little bumps called taste buds located in various regions of our tongue. So these taste cells are also going to be sometimes called gustatory cells. We'll just call them taste cells. They're going to uh, have different uh, proteins on them. There's a family of taste receptor proteins. There's not as many as the smell receptor proteins uh, or olfactory receptor proteins. There's probably only about 10 or 15. Either way, though, we're going to generate action potentials which need to travel back to our brain. In order to get taste uh, back to our brain, we're going to use mainly facial nerve or cranial nerve number seven. The signals will be routed to your thalamus, where they'll be routed up to your awareness in your cerebral cortex in what's sometimes called the gustatory cortex or taste cortex. It's kind of in the temporal region where it folds into your brain maybe temporal parietal region. All right, so for taste, we're gonna have taste cells. These taste cells are gonna make little receptor proteins that can bind to chemicals. They're gonna bind specific types of chemicals and be related to one specific taste. So for example, we'll have proteins that can detect sweet, some sour, salty, umami, which is savory, and also I left bitter off there. And so these taste receptor proteins will be specific for one type of taste. If you've ever heard of a taste map on your tongue, that's probably uh, a little incorrect. Uh, you can probably taste all the different flavors all throughout your entire tongue. All right, so let's zoom in on some of those taste cells. Some of those taste cells might express, for example, uh, a a taste receptor that can detect glucose. In that case, it will trigger action potentials and your brain will have to interpret that as something sweet. In other cases, you eat something salty and the sodium actually from the food you're ingesting can actually travel through channels, these little salty receptors, and cause your taste cell to trigger the relay neurons to send action potentials. In the case of sour, it's thought that the hydrogen ions donated from sour chemicals and sour food decreases the pH in your little taste cells, which then trigger uh, the inside of the cell to become positive, which triggers the, it to release neurotransmitter, and then that triggers the relay neurons to have action potentials. And again, the signals are all sent back to your brain, and your brain has to interpret whether you're tasting something salty and what it is. Uh, and so that's pretty interesting the way these little taste receptor proteins work in your taste cells.
Again, DNA determines the shape and the structure of those taste receptor proteins, and so there's probably a genetic component to taste as well. So remember, we learned about the olfactory neurons. There's probably about uh, 300 different olfactory receptor proteins. In terms of taste cells, probably maybe 20 or 30 identified so far. So the olfactory neurons will generally express only one of those receptor proteins, one type of those receptor proteins, so they can only detect one group of related smells. And so they really detect one type of smell. In terms of our taste cells, they probably express more than one receptor, but those receptor proteins will all be related to one specific taste. So if they make two or three sweet receptors, they'll only be able to detect one type of taste, such as sweet or bitter or sour. All right, so our olfactory neurons and our gustatory or taste cells are kind of similar in that they taste uh, or smell one type of uh, variety. Okay, so one thing I just wanted to point out was that uh, some of our taste receptor proteins are actually channels themselves, such as salty and sour. Uh, some of the other taste receptors are actually uh, receptors that are only indirectly linked to channels that allow, uh, say, sodium or calcium to enter the cells. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out that bitter taste in particular is usually something that we don't like. You probably would want to spit it out when you taste something really bitter. Uh, and this probably evolved from tasting poison or, you know, a poisonous plant or something and so that you spit it out. Uh, recently, it's been determined that people are very different in their sensitivity to bitter. Uh, and this is probably related to your genetics. Uh, so just remember when we have uh, groups of receptors, they'll be specific for one type of taste. Uh, don't forget that umami is the savory or meaty uh, uh, taste, and it's probably related to activation of specific types of receptors. People often say that when they have a cold that they can't taste their food. Uh, they might have a stuffy nose from the viral infection that they have in their nasal cavity. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that when we talk about smell, we're talking about olfactory neurons in your nasal cavity. And we're talking about taste, we're talking about taste cells in your taste buds on your tongue. And these are two distinct neural senses. And so really when you have a cold, what probably is affected is the smell of your food. And so it's probably better to say that when I have a cold, I can't smell my food. Your brain does something interesting. It mixes smell and taste and texture of your food together and thinks of it more as something combined called, which we should call flavor. And so actually the flavor is probably diminished due to the reduced smell you have when you have a cold. I wanted to mention a little bit about spinal cord injury and paralysis. Uh, right now there are no treatments to repair an injured spinal cord, and that's pretty unfortunate. But there's a lot of interest in the sense of smell in order to help try to repair these injuries. Why is that? Well, the olfactory neurons are pretty unique and they're that the few uh, central nervous or sort of brain neurons that regenerate. Uh, and so since these cells, and as well their helper cells, can actually help these cells regenerate and grow, these neurons. A lot of people are interested in these helper cells called olfactory and sheathing cells, as well as olfactory bulb cells and olfactory neurons in trying to help and maybe uh, repair spinal cord injury using either these cells or some stem cells uh, to develop future treatments. Our next learning objective is to explain the basic mechanisms responsible for hearing, or sometimes it's called auditory transduction. So when we talk about hearing, we're going to need to think about our temporal bone. The temporal bone there in our skull on either side has this tiny little embedded bony structure called the bony labyrinth. It's basically a fluid-filled little structure, um, sometimes called your inner ear. This thing is going to be responsible for hearing, as well as balance and head position, sometimes called your equilibrium. So each side has a bony labyrinth embedded in our temporal bone. Uh, and inside that bony labyrinth is going to be some fluid. So it's actually a fluid-filled fluid structure. Again, that's often called your inner ear. That inner ear is going to be responsible ultimately for hearing as well as balance. So before we can talk too much about hearing, we need to know a little bit about anatomy. So when we talk about anatomy for hearing, it'll also help us with anatomy for balance.
So pressure waves or sound waves are actually funneled into our ear uh, through our external ear and those sound waves travel through the external acoustic meatus to our tympanic membrane or our eardrum. That eardrum will vibrate. The eardrum is actually connected to some little bones that are in your middle ear. Your middle ear is actually an air-filled pocket connected to your nasal cavity. That's why sometimes people can get ear infections. They're actually getting an infection usually in their middle ear. So the tympanic membrane vibrates and it's connected to these little ossicles, which basically means small little bones. The small little bones then are connected to the bony labyrinth. Again, we said the bony labyrinth is fluid filled and it's bony and basically hard, but it has fluid inside of it. When the little auditory ossicles vibrate, they're going to actually move part of the bony labyrinth that is soft and cause fluid waves. And for hearing, we're really concerned about this part of the bony labyrinth called the cochlea. All right, the cochlea is then wired up to cranial nerve 8, and those signals will then go back to your brain for hearing. Parts of the bony labyrinth called the vestibule and the semicircular canals are used for balance, whereas the cochlea is used for hearing. All right, and so we're going to focus on the hearing first, and then we'll come back in the next learning objective and talk about balance. And again, this bony labyrinth that we're drawing and talk about is embedded in our temporal bone. All right, so let's look at this. So remember, pressure waves are basically what sound is, and the bigger your ears, the better you'll get those sound waves picked up. But either way, uh, we're going to want to figure out how do we get from pressure waves in the air to actually action potentials that can be carried through the neurons back to our brain. And these are the steps outlined here if you want to deposit. But basically, we got pressure waves cause our tympanic membrane to vibrate, which vibrates these tiny little bones, which then cause fluid waves to circulate inside that cochlea in the bony labyrinth. Uh, these little hair cells are not really, they don't really have hairs, they have cilias, uh, cilia that stick off of them, or stereocilia. Uh, they're going to help transduce uh, sound, and eventually those sounds will reach your brain and reach your awareness. All right, so let's look at these steps in more detail. And we're going to actually unwind that snail shell, that, uh, that spiral cochlea, and we'll unwind it just so we can see what's happening anatomically. Again, there's going to be little hair cells in there that are important. All right, now before Dr. Sullivan continues to talk about how the ear works, I do want to cut in here and tell you just a little bit more about hair cells, so hopefully you can visualize what's happening within the ear just a little bit more clearly. Okay, so hair cells um, don't actually have hairs. Um, instead, they have a little projections out of the cytoplasm that look a little bit like cilia. All right, so look like those little um, extensions um, off of the epithelial cells that can make a current, right, or can kind of join together and make a flagellum. Um, but these aren't there to make a current. Instead, these hairs, um, called stereocilia, um, are there to simply sway within a moving fluid. Okay, so you can think kind of like seaweed, kind of like floating around, um, just going with the current here. That's exactly what is happening with these hair cells. Um, hair cells are um, surrounded by fluid, which is going to um, have ripples in it when things like sound waves or movement of your head is going to occur. And so um, the main um, structures that look like cilia are called stereocilia, um, but certain cells, um, not the ones that are involved in hearing, but the ones that are involved in equilibrium, also have this extra structure here called a kinocilium. And this is important because this is um, detecting not only the fact that there is a disturbance in the fluid, um, but also the direction of that disturbance. Okay, um, in general, hair cells are considered to be something called mechanoreceptors. And not all mechanoreceptors are part of the special senses, but in this case, the mechanoreceptors are detecting a mechanical stimulus, a disturbance, a physical disturbance within the fluid within the ear. Okay, and so um, I do want to point out that um, these stereocilia are kind of sewn together. Um, if we zoom in on that, we can see that there are little ion channels. Right, and those ion channels are connected by this extra protein here um, so that anytime um, the 
cilia move, right? So if they move in this direction, essentially this little anchor protein here is going to be pulled, right, towards this stereocilium here, which will simultaneously open up this ion channel and allow the diffusion of ions into or out of the cell. And so this image here shows you exactly what is happening. Remember that these specialized cells can depolarize. Um, you know, any kind of the special cells can depolarize um, in order to um, send neurotransmitters um, to a downstream cell. Um, and so the way that that happens is, um, as you can see here, a pressure wave, so a ripple in the fluid in which these hair cells are embedded or submerged, um, the pressure wave is going to push the stereocilia to the side. And at the same time, uh, because of that disturbance, we're going to have the opening of these ion channels, right? Substances are going to flow down their concentration gradient as always. In this case, we're going to have an influx of potassium, which is going to lead to an influx of calcium. Now, as we know, calcium causes stuff to bind to other stuff. In this case, there are synaptic vesicles, essentially, that are filled with neurotransmitter, which then exocytose their neurotransmitter into the synapse with the next neuron. And so this is actually a neuron, um, and it is going to carry the message, um, in this case, out of the ear into the brain in order to be processed by the cerebral cortex. Um, and so um, the exact mechanisms that are happening here aren't terribly important. I really just wanted you to see how these hair cells function. All right, so again, a disturbance is going to lead to the opening of ion channels depolarization, and finally, the release of neurotransmitters to stimulate an action potential in the neuron that is actually going to carry the message to the brain. As I said, certain neurons, or uh, sorry, certain hair cells um, have a kinocilium as well. And so these ones would be found um, within the part of your ear that determ or that senses equilibrium. And we'll, we'll get into that here in just a minute, or actually uh, Dr. Sullivan will get into that here in a minute. Um, but what I wanna point out is that these particular neurons regularly automatically depolarize, all right? So if we look at um, timeline down here, each one of these little spikes represents an action potential. And as we can see, they are fairly regularly spaced. Um, and so this implies that even at rest, these cells are leaky, right? So they are constantly letting a little bit of this potassium in and therefore slowly depolarizing to ultimately um, release neurotransmitters. Um, but when a disturbance comes in this direction, uh, what that's going to do is it's going to open even more of these potassium channels and it's going to um, pull or it's going to depolarize the cell very rapidly. And so now each one of these little lines, again, is an action potential, right? But now they're so close together, it's really hard to tell them apart. And so it isn't just the presence of stimulation, the presence of action potentials here. It's actually the frequency at which action potentials are generated that will tell the brain that a disturbance has come in this direction. Now, on the other hand, we have, um, you know, if a disturbance come in th comes in this direction, right, that's going to close some of those potassium channels that were open in the scenario above, so in the cell when it was at rest. And so now it's still leaky, right, it's still depolarizing, but now it's depolarizing much more slowly than it was before. And so this change in frequency, rather than just the presence or absence of an action potential, tells the brain a lot more, um, not just that there is um, a disturbance, but that the dis disturbance is coming from the right or from the left. Okay, um, so now before we head back to Dr. Sullivan's lecture, I do want to um, show you a short clip um, that animates all of the different things that are happening in the ear. Now, it's a lot simpler than what we're going to be going into, but I think it helps you to be able to see how, for example, the auditory ossicles move, how um, you know the cochlea can be unwound, right, in order to talk about it, um, how the tympanic membrane moves. Right? So just take a look, and then Dr. Sullivan will come back and pick up where he left off talking about the hair cells. Many of us take for granted a very extraordinary organ, our ears. To understand the ear, 
we need to understand what sound is. The speakers you are listening to right now are vibrating, flexing in and out, causing a wave of pressure through the air. The frequency of these waves, or the speed at which the sound creating surface moves back and forth, affects the pitch of the sound. The level of air pressure in each wave is directly related to how loud the sound is. The outer part of our ear catches these waves. It faces forward and has a specially designed structure of curves helping us to determine the direction of the sound and also emphasize the frequencies used in human speech. Now that the sound waves are caught, they travel through the ear canal and strike against our eardrum, a thin membrane about 10 millimeters wide. Now that we receive the sound, the middle ear transfers this energy. The smallest bones in your body, the malleus, incus, and stapes, start in motion. The malleus is attached to the eardrum, and as the sound travels along, the force is amplified by leverage until it arrives at the stapes, which acts like a reversed piston, creating waves in the fluid of the inner ear. The most significant increase in pressure is caused by pneumatic amplification. The face of the stapes has a surface area of about 3.2 square millimeters, while the eardrum has a surface area of 55 square millimeters. Using this, along with leverage through the malleus and incus, the final pressure is 22 times greater than when the sound first arrived. Now we come to the most complicated part of the hearing, the cochlea. In reality, it is coiled up but it is easier to understand straightened out. There are actually three chambers inside, but let's take a look at the central part. The stapes is causing pressure waves to travel through the structure. Along the inside wall is about 20 to 30,000 reed-like fibers. As the waves move along, they encounter fibers with the correct resonant frequency and energy is released. These fibers aren't actually what give us the signal that we heard something. There is a special structure next to these fibers containing hair cells. When the fibers resonate, they cause the hair cells to move, which then sends an electrical impulse to the cochlear nerve and onto the brain. Certain pitches of sound will resonate in specific locations, and louder sounds will cause more hair cells to move. Our brain interprets all this raw data, making it possible to enjoy things like music or an engaging conversation. So again, sound is pressure waves traveling through the air. That's going to cause vibration of that eardrum, or as we call it, the tympanic membrane. The little ossicles are connected to the tympanic membrane, and the malleus, the incus, and the stapes will start to vibrate. Turns out that the stapes is actually attached to part of the bony labyrinth near the cochlea. So when those auditory ossicles are vibrating in your middle ear, they're going to start these uh, pressure waves, fluid waves, uh, starting inside of our cochlea. So the, I like to think of the stapes as knocking on the vestibule near the cochlea, which creates, creates fluid waves or fluid vibrations inside the cochlea. These fluid waves then are going to stimulate some tiny little hair cells that are embedded inside the cochlea. Those fluid waves will stimulate and bend the cilia of the hair cells, which stimulates them. And so again, this is for hearing, and we started with sound waves, and now we've got fluid waves in our cochlea. When those stereo cilia or cilia get bent, the little cell gets excited, releasing an excitatory neurotransmitter such as glutamate. That then stimulates action potentials in a relay neuron of cranial nerve 8 those action potentials will eventually reach our brain and our awareness and we'll hear. So again, all of this is happening in our inner ear or cochlea uh, when we talk about the hair cells for hearing. And don't forget, connected to that vestibule are the things we need for balance as well, and those are going to be hair cells too. All right, so again, when we stimulate these hair cells in different regions, we're going to actually detect different frequencies uh, of sound. So again, when we talk about uh, hearing, we have these little hair cells, which we probably could have named them cilia cells. They have these long cilia called stereocilia. Uh, 
But in either way, uh, the different hair cells in different parts of the cochlea get stimulated by different sound frequencies. So one part of the cochlea will be for low frequency, another part of the cochlea for high frequency. Humans have uh, a frequency range that they can hear and other animals and insects can hear other frequencies, uh, but we're going to be able to hear uh, in the 20 to 20 uh, thousand Hertz range and how does that work well it turns out the cochlea is um, arranged with this basilar membrane that our little hair cells sit on and that basilar membrane has different thickness depending on which part of the cochlea it is in so because it has different thickness you can imagine that the fluid as the fluid has these little waves the thicker parts and the thinner parts of the basilar membrane will uh, change motion differently and so this is going to affect which hair cells get stimulated. So the hair cells in some parts of the cochlea will get stimulated by high frequency, for example, this portion of the cochlea. And other times, other hair cells will get stimulated with different frequencies. Again, it has to do with the movement and motion of the fluid and the basilar membrane, which has different thickness. So these areas that respond to low frequency in the little hair cells are actually sitting on a thinner part of the basilar membrane. So the take home message really is that hair cells are activated or stimulated depending on the frequency of the sound. And the hair cells in different locations of the cochlea can detect uh, different frequencies. So the way you can detect different frequencies is by stimulation of those hair cells. If you're wondering how the cochlea detects louder sounds or softer sounds, I like to just think of it as a louder sound will activate more hair cells, creating a larger burst of action potentials, and that will be interpreted by your brain as a louder sound. Remember, we use cranial nerve 8 to send signals to our sensory relay station, the thalamus, which then routes the uh, awareness of sound uh, into your cerebral cortex in the temporal lobe where your auditory cortex is located. Again, it all starts with those little hair cells transducing uh, and creating an activation of the relay neurons. So if you're wondering what causes hair lo uh, hearing loss, uh, old age, chronic exposure to very loud sound can damage those hair cells and even cause some of the hair cells to die. Once you've lost the hair cells, you'll lose hearing in that frequency. Very loud chronic sounds, such as you get in the workplace, again, could damage those hair cells. Often old age will cause loss of those hair cells. Sometimes you'll actually get a ringing or sort of a phantom sound from your inner ear in your cochlea that's called tinnitus or tinnitus. Again, it's due to damage of your little hair cells. Uh, another thing to consider is that you have to have these special proteins and channels in the cilia for you to be able to hear. Some people are born without those uh, proteins or some of their associated proteins in the cilia, and so they have hearing loss or deafness when uh, they're born. Our next learning objective is to discuss the mechanisms for balance or equilibrium. So this is your sense of being able to detect when you're spinning or sometimes when you're tilting your head or falling down. All of this would be uh, detected in our inner ear in our sense of balance. Our sense of balance is important to keep us from falling but also to keep our eyes tracking when we spin our head. So again, we're right next to that cochlea. We're in the vestibule. Uh, and also the semicircular canals. These uh, things are going to have hair cells which help us detect whether we're spinning or tilting or moving. Again, it's that same fluid filled space. We're just in a different region of the bony labyrinth. The little hair cells in there will detect motion when their cilia are bent. All right, so for our sense of balance in our inner ear, it's really about detecting motion and position uh, and often position of our head. You'll hear people again call this their inner ear along with the cochlea.
So the first thing we're going to see is how do you detect spinning? So sometimes you're spinning your head around briefly uh, just to look at something. That causes fluid waves and fluid movement in those semicircular canals which are oriented in different planes and that's going to stimulate hair cells, bend their cilia as the fluid moves by. That's going to cause them to excite relay neurons which cause action potentials again to move back towards your brain through the thalamus to your balance centers which I assume are in your temporal lobe uh, and then you detect an awareness of spinning or movement. All right, so again, we've mentioned hair cells, these fluid movements inside the semicircular canals or the vestibule will actually cause the stereocilia or cilia to move and bend. And when they move and bend, it's going to open up channels. And often we would consider sodium or calcium to rush in. This is going to be a special case where sometimes potassium is really, really high in the fluid of your inner ear. But in either case, we just re recognize that the cell depolarizes or becomes positive on the inside which then stimulates it to release neurotransmitter and we get action potential sent back towards our brain. What about when you tilt your head? It's, it's very similar or if you're ever falling. Uh, instead of the semicircular canals, we're going to be in the vestibule. So when you tilt your head, you have these cool hair cells with a jello uh, substance on top of them with these little tiny stones called autoliths and that helps make the jello heavy so whenever you tilt your head the jello moves or shifts and that bends the hair cells which stimulates these cells and then you get action potentials and you interpret that as moving your head or position which then is important for your balance all right so again the vestibule and the semicircular canals have hair cells that can detect everything you need for motion and balance. Sometimes you'll have problems with this part of your inner ear and you might have something called vertigo where you feel like you're spinning or falling even when you're not. Why are all these signals important? Well, to maintain your posture, to allow you to track your eyes when you're moving around in, in uh, complex ways, and also some autonomic and automatic reflexes uh, that are regulated by our inner ear in order to track your eyes and keep your balance. Okay, our final learning objective is to look at the basic mechanisms for vision. So how are you able to see? And of course, that's going to be all about our eyeball and how it generates action potentials and sensitivity to light. So just for some basic eye anatomy, uh, we'll cover the external eye and the internal eye, but we'll cover a lot of this in lab. But you're probably familiar with that clear contact lens of tissue that we call our cornea. It's located at the front of our eye and it's very clear. You have the white of the eye, which is the sclera, but in the front of your eye, you actually have a thin layer called conjunctiva that covers the inside of your eyelid and also covers that whitened sclera. The pupil is simply a hole in this ring structured of the eye. The ring structure of the eye is called the iris. It's the pigmented portion that's either green, brown, or blue. Again, uh, the pupil is simply a hole in it, so light is able to pass through our clear cornea, through the fluid, through that open hole in the iris called the pupil, and reach the back of our eye. The main structural layer of your eye is the white of your eye, and that's called the sclera. That fleshy contact lens in front of your eye that's completely clear is called the cornea. And then that pigmented ring, which also includes smooth muscle that changes size, is called the iris. The iris is able to control the size of a hole in it, and that hole is called the pupil. Again, we can make that pupil bigger or smaller by controlling the smooth muscle in the layer of the iris. We have a darkened layer at the back of our eye called the choroid. The choroid will help pick up any um, sort of bounced around or refracted light. So light doesn't bounce around and we can see really well in the daytime. We also have a structure called the ciliary body which holds and suspends our lens kind of right in the middle of the eye, right behind the iris. So that clear lens again is going to help allow light to focus along with the cornea and reach the back of our eye. So as light, as light travels through the cornea and the lens, it is focused perfectly on the back of the eye. The back of the eye has a neural layer, and that neural layer is going to be called the retina. Uh, 
or some people just say retina. The retina is famous because it's the neural layer at the back of the eye. It has cells like rods and cones and relay neurons uh, and interneurons that make your eye light sensitive. So the light sensitive cells are called rods and cones. Rods are mostly in the periphery of your retina, whereas cones are located centrally in a structure called the macula. So mostly where you focus, you're focusing the light at the macula, which has lots and lots of cones. So cones are important for daytime vision, for high acuity color vision, whereas rods are important for nighttime vision, and they're kind of located in your periphery. When these cells get activated or uh, stop being activated, they're going to send signals through relay neurons that converge on the optic disc and create your optic nerve. It's also known as cranial nerve 2. The blind spot is created by the, the start of cranial nerve 2 because there's no rods and cones located at the optic disc. This is also where blood vessels can enter into the retina and supply the retina with needed oxygen. All right, so that's basic anatomy of the eye. Remember that your cornea and lens are for focusing light on the retina, and then the rods and cones are specific cells in our retina that allow us to detect light. The cones are more for color vision and high acuity vision, whereas the rods are more for night vision and low light vision. Right, I just wanted to remind you what creates your eye color. The eye color is due to that ring structure called the iris, and there really is only one pigment in the iris, and that's melanin. So if you have blue eyes, you just don't have much melanin, and if you have brown eyes, you have lots more melanin. And then hazel is kind of a mix in between. You can even see clusters of melanin inside your iris on your iris like freckles or moles. The other thing to consider about our iris is that it can change shape, and we have these autonomic nerves that are going to control the smooth muscle at our, of our iris. And in low light, your pupil will be dilated because the iris opens up, and then in bright light, it will close off and make the pupil smaller. That's due to these smooth muscle layers that are controlled by our autonomic nervous system, uh, which releases different neurotransmitters. We'll learn more about our autonomic nervous system later. Okay, allow me to interject one more time before Dr. Sullivan continues to talk about the retina um, and about all the different things that are happening in the eye uh, and with specifically within the photoreceptors. Um, now, he just finished talking about the iris and about how the iris, of course, is a muscle, which we know from earlier this semester. Um, we know that the iris is made up of two muscles, the constrictor pupillae and the dilator pupillae muscles. Um, this, of course, adjusts pupil diameter. And as he said, um, these muscles work right based on feedback from our autonomic nervous system we'll get into that uh, next week um, but these muscles relax or contract based on how much light is um, outside the eye and therefore how much light is going to come into the eye um, and so um, there is one other circumstance uh, that I want to point out where these muscles are going to either contract or relax based on what's going on um, in the visual field. Um, and that um, is called accommodation. Um, and so this first animation that I want to show you um, is showing you how the pupil is going to adjust how much light comes into the eye, whether you're looking at something close up or something far away. Right? So making sure that um, the light rays are bent to the right extent for the um, image to be focused exactly on this particular spot of the retina. Now remember that this part of the retina is called the macula region. You might also see it called the macula lutea. And within that macula lutea, there's a little indentation where there are the most cones of anywhere else in your retina. Um, that's called the fovea centralis. Okay, so you might just see a couple different terms for um, the same general region, right? The area of the highest acuity. Um, but anyway, back to this clip that I want to show you, um, you will see the iris changing shape, right? Ultimately um, allowing more or less light into the pupil and therefore into the eye um, based on how close the object is. What you will also see is that ciliary muscle or the ciliary body 
right? Actually adjusting the shape of the lens right? in order to refract those rays more or less depending on how close the object is. And the final thing that you're going to see, um, or at least that you should uh, be aware of, um, is that as something comes towards you, um, or even in general, as you're you know, reading a book, going from line to line to line, um, your eyes, of course, are moving, and all of that movement is completed by the extrinsic eye muscles. Now remember that there are four of them. Um, there are the four rectus muscles, superior, inferior, lateral, and medial. And there are also the superior and inferior oblique muscles. And so those are what actually move your eyes and allow you to even begin focusing the light on your retina. Okay, so that's the first video that is accommodation. Um, the second animation that I want to show you um, is pretty much a summary of a lot of the different structures that you've seen so far. Um, but it's an animation, so you actually get to see the layers kind of being pulled back. Um, also, it is going to introduce you to what... Dr. Sullivan is going to break down for you a little bit more um, in the next section of his talk, um, specifically um, how rods and cones are going to be um, excited by the light, depolarize, um, and relay the message ultimately up to the brain. And so again, watch these two animations. The links are on the screen if you want to um, take a look at them in more detail. Um, and then back to Dr. Sullivan's talk. Separately. First, as an object approaches, both eyes track it in a process called convergence. The size of the eyes in this example has been greatly exaggerated so that the subtle movement that takes place during convergence can be seen. Convergence of the eyes keeps the image of the object of interest centered on the fovea, the part of the retina where resolution is highest. If the eyes do not converge appropriately, diplopia, or double vision occurs. Second, the pupil must constrict to restrict the entry of light rays diverging from a near object, since diverging rays cannot be bent enough by the periphery of the lens to make them fall on the fovea. If the pupil were to remain dilated, the image would be blurred. Finally, the shape of the lens must change, increasing its refractive index so that the light rays passing through it converge on the fovea. In distance vision, the lens is pulled at its equator by the suspensory ligament, so that it is relatively thin. When the muscles of the ciliary body contract, the tension on the suspensory ligament decreases and this allows the lens to assume a rounder shape, increasing its power to bend light. As a result, the image is focused on the fovea. Combined convergence, pupillary constriction, and rounding up of the lens all function to keep an object in focus as it approaches the eye. The location of the eyes enables us to see length, width, depth, and distance of an object. The eye has three layers the sclera, choroid, and retina. The sclera is the outer white layer that maintains the shape of the eye. Muscles attached to the sclera control eye movements. Choroid is the middle layer that contains the blood vessels. The cornea is a clear circular area in the sclera where light enters the eye. The pupil is the circular opening in the front of the choroid. The iris is the colored smooth muscle surrounding the pupil, which adjusts the size of the opening according to the brightness of light. The lens is located behind the pupil and between the anterior and posterior chambers. The lens is a transparent, flexible biconvex structure that bends or refracts light rays, so they focus on the nerve cells of the retina. The chambers are filled with a watery fluid that gives shape to the eye and helps refract the light rays. The anterior fluid is called the aqueous humor and the posterior fluid is called the vitreous humor. The retina is the inner layer and contains the nerve cells, the rods and cones, and the bipolar cells. Rods are sensitive to light but do not sense color. Cones sense color. The highest concentration of cones is in the fovea centralis. The rods and cones synapse with bipolar cells. 
which then synapse with the ganglia cells whose axons form the optic nerve. Light rays enter the eye through the cornea, pupil, and lens, where the light rays are bent or refracted to focus them on the rods and cones, which transmit the stimulus to the optic nerve and then to the occipital lobe of the brain for interpretation. All right, we're going to focus more on this retina since it's the light or photosensitive layer of the back of the eye, probably one of the most important for you to be able to see. So we're going to have photoreceptor cells or light sensitive cells such as rods and cones in our, in our retina that can actually detect light. Again, I keep saying it, but the cones are for color vision and the rods are for low light or night vision. And they're actually uh, dispersed in different areas of our retina the rods are located more in the periphery and the cones are located at that special area of our retina called the macula. When light hits these cells, it's going to change their activity, much like we've learned with the senses of chemical taste and, and chemical smell. But instead, it's going to be light hitting, hitting these cells and stimulating and turning them on and off. We also need relay neurons and interneurons to help these action potentials reach our, our optic nerve, eventually routed to our thalamus and our cerebrum and our visual cortex in our occipital lobe. Again, the rods and cones are not distributed evenly throughout your retina, but depending on um, where they are will make you more or less sensitive to light. So for example, the macula is most sensitive because it has the highest density of these cones. So let's just consider a rod. Since co cones and rods kind of behave in the same way, I wanted to consider a rod cell. A rod cell will have these photo or light sensitive proteins called opsins, or rhodopsins specifically in rods, but it's in the opsin family. In the dark, so when no light is, or low light or no light is hitting that uh, rod cell, the photosensitive proteins allow these little sodium channels to be open. Sodium rushes into the cell. It becomes slightly depolarized or positive and releases an inhibitory neurotransmitter which shuts down the relay neurons. And so in the dark, you don't get any signals or any action potentials traveling down your retina from this set of rods and relay neurons. All right, so no signals. Let's consider what happens when we hit a rod cell with light. And the same would be true for a cone, just slightly different proteins. So when light hits the photosensitive uh, proteins in our rod cell, it's actually going to cause a chemical reaction which causes those little voltage, or excuse me, those sodium channels. Those little sodium channels are actually going to close. And now the inside of our rod cell will become more negative or repolarized it stops releasing inhibitory neurotransmitter, which allows the little interneurons and relay neurons to get excited, and you get action potentials sent back towards your brain uh, through your cranial nerve too. So again, it uh, depended on these uh, light-sensitive proteins called opsins, which also have uh, a chemical or molecule called retinol with them that makes them sensitive to light. The important thing to notice is that in the dark, the sodium channels are open and the cell is slightly depolarized. But in the light, the cell actually closes those sodium channels, goes back to negative, and is repolarized. That allows these little relay neurons to not be inhibited. So in the light, we send a burst of action potentials down these relay neurons Sometimes they're called ganglion cells, but you can just remember them as relay neurons. So remember these retinal cells, such as rods and cones, in the light, they're going to be repolarized. So in the light, they're repolarized. This stops the release of an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which allows the relay neurons to have a burst of action potentials. So again, these cells are kind of weird in the dark they're actually allowing the sodium in, which causes them to shift their membrane voltage towards zero, at say minus 40 or minus 30. But when they're hit with light, it causes a chemical reaction which closes the sodium channels and the cells shift back towards rest at, to minus 80. They become repolarized. So in the dark, they're depolarized, and in the light, they're more repolarized or more negative.
Again, that's pretty strange compared to all the other cells we've learned, uh, but that's how your retinal light sensitive cells work. So remember these rods and cones are able to be light sensitive because they express special proteins called the opsin proteins. And these opsin proteins allow uh, for these cells to actually change their chemistry and chemical reactions based on their light sensitivity. So when light hits these opsins, it actually causes a chemical reaction inside the cells which can then gate and open and close those sodium channels. So in the case of light, those sodium channels close. We also need vitamin A or retinol uh, for our opsins to be photosensitive. All right, so one thing to consider is that our genes determine our proteins, and we have four genes and four proteins for these visual opsins. One of them is called rhodopsin, uh, and then there are three opsins that can detect different wavelengths of light. Each cone will actually express only one of the visual opsins, so maybe the sensitive to blue or sensitive to green or sensitive to red light. Uh, two of the opsins for red and green are located on chromosome X. And so we're going to see how this can cause more color blindness in males. So if you consider that we have these two opsins that make us sensitive to red and green wavelengths of light expressed in our cones, it turns out that females have two X chromosomes, so they carry two copies of these two opsins. So you might have a good copy and a bad copy, or two good copies on your X chromosomes. But if you're a male, you only have one X chromosome. So if you carry a good copy, great. But if you carry a bad copy, you will not be able to make those opsins for red or green, maybe one or both, which will then make you sensitive uh, or insensitive to distinguish between red and green, and you'll have red-green color blindness. What about if you have blurry vision or vision loss? What can cause that? Well, refractive errors are one of the causes of vision loss, and it's basically a focusing error. Uh, there's nothing really wrong with uh, your eye, medically maybe, but just more structurally. So it usually has to do with the shape of your eyeball relative to the shape of your cornea and your lens. This causes you to focus light either beyond your retina, behind it, or short of your retina. So this is a focusing error. Usually it has to do with your eyeball shape. So for example, if your eyeball is too long, you'll actually focus short of the retina. And so in that case, you'll have blurry vision because your eyeball's too long, you're focusing short of it. This causes nearsightedness. You might be able, okay to read close up, but you can't see things far away when you drive. Again, you can use a contact lens or an eyeglass lens or maybe even LASIK surgery uh, to help correct this refractive error. So hopefully you focus perfectly on the retina. Another refractive problem is when your cornea, your cornea should be nice and round shaped, somewhat like a basketball or a cut basketball. Uh, so when your uh, cornea is round like a basketball, that's normal, but some people have a misshapen cornea, which is shaped more like maybe a football, and that's called astigmatism. It basically causes light to focus perfectly in some areas of the retina, but might focus short or long in other parts of the retina. And so that can cause uh, blurry vision. Again, that can be corrected with things like a lens. If you ever notice that older people tend to hold their cell phones and menus and books far away, it's a condition called presbyopia. So they can see far, but they cannot see things close. And when we look at the lens, the lens actually changes shape depending on whether you're reading near or far. And that lens can be changed shape by the ciliary body holding it. When we want to look at things close up, we need a round lens. And when we look at things far away, we need a flat lens. And what we see in older people is their lens is no longer elastic and won't round up. Because it won't round up, they can't see things very close. So what they do, since their lens is always flat, they just hold things far away so that they can actually see them. This usually happens in your 40s uh, naturally. But again, glasses and reading glasses can help that. I want to talk a little bit about other causes of, of blindness and vision loss. Cataracts are one of the leading causes, I think the leading cause of blindness in the world. So what is a cataract? Cataract. 
Uh, normally our lens is very clear and light passes through it, but these cataracts are protein deposits within the lens which cloud it up and cause it basically to block the light. When your lens becomes too cloudy and, and has too much uh, protein deposit in it, it actually can stop uh, the light from reaching your retina and cause total blindness and vision loss. The good news is to correct this, you can do surgery to use a mechanical or, or uh, human-made lens uh, rather than a biological lens, and that lens replacement allows you to see again. That surgery can be done pretty easily from the front of the eye, cutting between the cornea and the sclera and dilating the iris so you can reach uh, that defective lens, take it out, and replace it. So lens replacement surgery corrects cataracts. The other cause of vision loss and blindness that's somewhat common is retinal damage. And so the retina becomes damaged in diabetic retinopathy, something called macular degeneration, as well as during high blood pressure, it can damage uh, the blood vessels of the eye. So all of these share in common uh, blood vessel damage, especially wet macular degeneration diabetic retinopathy and high blood pressure, that blood vessel damage then uh, damages those neural retinal cells and eventually uh, damages your retina. If you were to look at a healthy retina uh, with an ophthalmoscope through your eye, this is what your eye doctor sees, you would see this nice pattern of uh, the macula as well. If you look at a, a damaged or unhealthy retina, you can really see the striking deposits and damaged blood vessels. And even in that important macula for your central vision, uh, you can see damage. So again, these all share these blood vessel damage problems. And so as we come to the end of this lesson today, I do want to point out uh, once again that all of these terms that are kind of purple and underlined here um, are important for you guys to know for an upcoming exam, as well as the concepts behind them. And so I just listed um, most of the, uh, the conditions that Dr. Sullivan just talked about. Um, definitely make sure that um, if you didn't take note before, make sure that you um, learn um, about these things uh, to the extent that he talked about them. Okay. Um, and there is one final topic that I want to point out. Um, throughout this talk, we have seen um, how this special sense information is actually relayed to the brain. We talked earlier this semester, um, earlier this week actually, about how um, the cerebral cortex is divided up um, and different parts of the cortex um, are responsible for taking in sensory information and actually making sense of it. Um, and so actually learning the pathways, right, how the information gets from the ear ultimately to the appropriate auditory cortex um, of the uh, cerebrum, um, how olfactory information gets to the brain, um, and so on and so forth. And so the last piece of this puzzle here is how visual information um, gets sent to the appropriate region of the cerebral cortex. In this case, um, the appropriate region happens to be within um, the, all the way to the back um, of your cerebrum within the occipital lobe. And so um, this image looks a little bit weird, um, but just to give you a little bit of perspective, this is looking down on the eyes, right? So pretty much they're sectioned through. Um, most of the brain has been removed except for the relevant structures. And again, we are like above the head looking down. And so um, what we already know is that our photoreceptors uh, reside within the retina and the uh, posterior of our eye, um, all the way in the innermost of three layers or three tunics of the eye. Um, the photoreceptors, of course, relay visual information to the bipolar cells, and then the bipolar cells relay information or release neurotransmitters on the ganglion cells. And it's the ganglion cells whose axons join together to ultimately exit the eye via the blind spot, right, or the optic disc. Okay, um, and so once these um, axons, right, the ganglion cell axons are out of the eye, um, they are bundled together as optic nerve number two. All right, so these cells actually start in the eye and they are going to run all the way into the brain. Okay, um, take note of, oops, this is interesting. Uh, 
animations here, um, that information from the left eye and information from the right eye is going to cross in the middle, right? So this is all the way underneath the brain. Um, they cross at the optic chiasm. And if you look closely, you'll see that um, neurons from this particular part of the eye, which of course sees way over here, um, are ultimately going to run across the midline, so the process of decussation, and crossing the midline so that they can uh, inform the opposite side of the brain what's going on. Um, and they do that right here, right? Decussation. Okay, and so um, essentially what this is showing us is that your right field of vision, right, so something that you would see on the right, is essentially going to end up in the left occipital lobe. Okay. Um, all right, this blue right here right, are essentially the um, photoreceptors that would detect something in your left field of vision, right? So this light is going to shine way over here. And so these um, ganglion cells are going to um, actually tell the right cerebral hemisphere what's going on on the left side of the brain, right? And if you look closely, um, if you can still see it, um, you can see that there are some neurons from the left eye that end up going to the right side and some that stay on the left side. Ultimately, this is just because um, the right side of our brain wants to know about what's going on in the left side of the body and vice versa. And so again, um, these optic nerves cross over in the middle at the optic chiasm. Now, where exactly do these neurons go from here? Well, they are going to synapse. They're going to relay this information um, to other parts of the brain. Um, and you know, this right here, you do not need to know this particular term. Um, but what I do want you to see is that after synapsing, um, the next set of neurons is going to send this message all the way back to the occipital lobe. And so in the occipital lobe, um, we have the primary visual cortex, right? So that's just taking in the raw data. Is there light? Is there not light? That's it. And then next to that is the association cortex. And this is what actually makes sense of all that information, right? When we have light here, we don't have light there. We have this color here, but not there. Um, maybe um, now we know that that is, you know, a TV, that is a car, that is a tree, right? So we can actually associate um, the, these patterns in light and color with something that we actually remember. Um, one last place where this information goes, and that is right here. I know this looks really weird in the middle here without the rest of the brain, um, but this group of structures is part of your midbrain. Collectively, it's called the corpora quadrigemina because there are four of these little ganglia or bundles of neuron cell bodies. Um, the two superior colliculi, the two top bumps, um, are responsible for visual reflexes. All right, so a visual reflex you might think of, um, you know, if you see um, a paper airplane coming at your face out of the corner of your eye, you automatically blink, right? You don't stop and say, huh, maybe this is going to be a problem. Maybe I should make, no, you are going to blink and you're going to ask questions later. And so the visual information coming directly from your eyes is going to be relayed to the superior colliculi of your midbrain so that the visual reflexes, right, the blinking of your eyes um, can actually um, happen right away, right? You don't want to stop and ask your occipital lobe to make a decision about this. You need to immediately blink your eyes and ask questions later. Okay, so again, it is important for you guys to know these pathways of where the information is going. Um, it's important to focus on the blue and underlined words throughout this PowerPoint, as well as um, understand the concepts and the processes, so actually the physiology of special senses, as described by Dr. Chris Sullivan. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day.